Shall we start, ma'am? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I heartily welcome all of you in the Langley's online lecture series, day 15, in the second se session. At the outset, we, the team of Langley, need to thank all the participants who have joined with us by logging Zoom app regularly and those who are watching uh, live on uh, YouTube channel, Langley's Educators. Thank you very much for your love, <coughs> words of appreciation, blessings, and academic support. We have been receiving overwhelming response from all over India and abroad. Nationally and internationally acclaimed academicians are going to deliver their talks on various aspects of language and literature on the forthcoming days. In addition to that, it's not the end of lecture series. It's the just a new beginning. We will arrange such lecture series every now and then. We'll try our best to invite well-known academicians <coughs> during this lockdown period. Uh, there are certain instructions for the participants. We are giving unique certificate to each and every participants, but participants need to fill uh, the Google form and send their Zoom participation screenshot or YouTube channel Langley's Educator subscription screenshot where you have watched all these videos to the email ID elanglitmotivators at the red gmail.com. Our designer is working on the certificate. Very soon you will receive the Google form link. We are not generating the certificates by Google forms. We are working on the certificates manually. That's why it takes time. You need to approach me through mail after 10th of May. You can also visit our website www.langlit.org. Kindly keep in touch. Don't forget to subscribe the channel so that you will get uh, notifications of further lectures. So let's share knowledge and grow together. Friends, uh, today we have uh, with us a well-known nationally acclaimed academician, Mandakini Bhattacharya ma'am. She is from Kolkata. Uh, she is currently uh, as an assistant professor of English at Fakir Chand College affiliated with uh, University of uh, Kolkata in West Bengal, India. She is a multilingual poet, literary critic, and translator. She has presented papers at various international and national seminars. Her scholarly articles and poems have been published in international and national journals and also in books. She was invited by Sahitya Academy, New Delhi, and participated in the All India Young Writers Meet organized by it in February 2020. She is associate editor of the Muse of uh, Now Paradigm Anthology. She was felicitated at several international and national poetry festivals and wa was awarded, uh, awarded the Philosophy Poetica International Achievement Award, Master of the World in recognition of her poetry by Philosophica Poeta Poetica and Grand Production Canada at the World Poetry Conference Batinda Punjab in 2019. Her poems have been appeared along with the legends of Indo-English poetry such as K. N. Daruwala, K. Sachinandan, Bindu Upadi, and Sanjukta Das Gupta. She is currently involved in two Sahitya Academy translation projects. She is the content editor for UGC online repression course and joint secretary of uh, Pro, uh, PROYAS, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, women's uh, NGO in Kolkata. So without further delay, it's my honor and privilege to invite Mandakini Bhattacharya ma'am to deliver her talk on reading madness <coughs> and patriarchy in English literature. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Prashant. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Absolutely. A very wonderful afternoon to all my friends who have turned up here, my seniors, um, path-breaking uh, participants who are all uh, luminaries in their own fields. And I am feeling very, very humbled and honored, Prashant, to be able to present my talk here, to have been invited to you. Prashant is um, extremely dynamic and a very good friend since day one. I'm sure all of you appreciate him as much as I do because he is such 
such a easy going jovial fellow and which hides his extreme erudition is extremely extremely um, uh, very um, erudite and he has been in in all corners of the world i guess uh, delivering his talks and lectures so it is a very humbling experience to be invited by him to share my views on this panel so thank you everyone i can see your comments coming in prashant am i still audible um i um yes, am i fine much. you can go ahead no problem okay thank yes, you so much you. so uh, without uh, further delay um, i shall start today's talk which is reading quote and quote reading because uh, i would like it to uh, to read the significance into something so reading uh, madness and patriarchy um, in english literature so um uh, this is a part of a talk which uh, i have delivered at uh, a place and then there is another part of the talk which is um a sort of a paper which i had put together so i will start with uh, uh, my powerpoint presentation uh, which um, should be here uh prashant am i still or uh, still visible yes 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 Okay, uh, so can you see uh, me as well as my slide? Yes, everything. Is, okay, no problem. <laughs> okay, the slide is there, right? Yes, the, yes. Okay, so the first slide is uh, uh, an introduction by way of a poem by Emily Dickinson, and uh, this poem um, is uh, actually uh, something which uh, announces the topic that we are discussing today. So you can read it while I start talking. So the literary history of madness is as old as sin. Now Socrates and Plato had both declared that poetic genius was inseparable from madness. However, in the Old Testament, it is God's anger at human sin and pride that leads him to afflict people with madness. The Bible in fact presents several notions of madness such as distraction and inspiration by God, possession by evil spirits, self destructive and self protective worldliness possession and hostility to god individual godless conduct social and ecclesiastical anarchy and existential pessimism <clears throat> now to go to the next slide madness is found abundantly in the forms in the in the works of john gar spencer sydney marlow all of them have discussed uh, madness and this madness seems to arise from unrequited love bereavement lust drink the furies and vengeance specific biblical ideas occur for example when spencer you can see him there at the top right corner when spencer views suicide as madness in the fairy queen on the left is uh, john gar's uh, picture of himself and in vox clementis in fact you will find that john gar uh, when the peasants rebel he says that they have lost their wits they have lost their reason and they are mad because they are rebelling and they resemble animals they no longer resemble human beings so a rather uh, class based analysis of the peasants rebellion i would say um down there you have of course dr foster who was driven by, mad by the quest for knowledge again by marlow as portrayed by marlow so the reading of mad women in english literature also indicates several themes the role of the domestic in women's lives expression of selfhood and subversion or rebellion against the patriarchal order of society <clears throat> as you are all familiar some of the most famous mad women in fact are found in shakespeare's uh, dramas um this is a quote by sydney again whom i was talking of just now and he said anger the stoic said was a short madness <clears throat> madness that inexplicable affliction was an abhorrence during the middle ages in elizabethan england however it became a secret obsession with the people they were both repelled and fascinated by it so great was this obsession that people suffering from melancholy came to signify in fact a separate section of the society called the malcontents um some however believe this affliction to be inspired by the occult or witchcraft like discussed by reginald scott in his book of 1584 there were others who consulted physicians for cure shakespeare's son-in-law john hall was one of them 
Uh, Prashant, are you able to see the next slide yes, as yes, I progress? Yes, yes, okay, yes, yes. okay. So still a third section believed that madness was an affliction that could be cured by willpower. Uh, thus, through um, those superstition held back, certain trends took a tentative step towards modern psychoanalysis. Bethlehem Hospital in England, you can see a picture of it, a painting of it rather, and uh, it was also called Bedlam, and it had started treating mental patients already, and it held a morbid fascination for the Elizabethans. The stage faithfully reflected this obsession through the mad creatures created by Kidd, Shakespeare, Fletcher, Decker, Webster, et al. Now, the med medical science in the Renaissance treated hysteria as a condition created by, quote, a diseased and wandering womb. Uh, hence, it was a woman's disease. So we have, we find here a direct relation to how patriarchal uh, norms viewed madness as a woman's disease, curable by marriage, notice, and, quote, bringing the wild uterus under a husband's control, unquote, as Professor Carol Neal says. Now, mono, uh, uh, menopause and postpartum depression uh, could be other causes. In fact, Robert Burton, in his Anatomy of Melancholy, written in 1621, claimed that privileged noble women were more afflicted by hysteria. This reminded the Elizabethan theater going public of Ophelia, Lady Macbeth, Juliet, and Cleopatra, who are all aristocratic characters portrayed on stage by Shakespeare. Renaissance theatrical convention dictated that mad women be deconstructed as erotomaniacs, where female tendency to madness and suicide was regarded as caused by sexual frustration of unrequited love. Again, the mad women of Shakespeare, such as Ophelia, Juliet, and the Gola's daughter in Two Noble Kinsmen, which Shakespeare co-wrote with Fletcher, they conform to this prototype. Ophelia, in fact, owing to her aristocratic background and ambiguous virginity, came to be considered as the ideal classical case of female insanity by George Farrell in 1833. And as Ellen Showalter suggests, Delacroix's series of pictures of Ophelia produced between 1830 and 1850 further stamped upon her the prototype of the female asylum patient, Ophelia, the name which had earlier indicated a benefit or an excess of food, now came to be the name of a typical female insanity. So all female patients during that time were classified as Ophelia types, notably by doctors like Charles Bucknell in the 19th century. Dr. Hugh Welsh Diamond uh, wrote a psychiatric treatise on female insanity modeled on photographs taken by him and he dressed up his female patients whom he stylized as Ophelia and treated them and noted down his findings. A similar practice was followed by Jean Martin Charcot, doctor, who trained his patients to perform like Shakespearean heroines under hypnosis in front of the camera as a cathartic and therapeutic measure, which brings us to his very famous patient, a uh, very famous uh, student, Sigmund Freud, who studied under him for four months from 1885 to 86, and revered him greatly and went on to label women as intrinsically susceptible to the faults of their sex and thus vulnerable to madness and hysteria. This kind of mad characters in Shakespeare are said to respond to two gendered stereotypes the aggressive and intellectual madness, which is portrayed by males like Hamlet, Macbeth, and King Lear, and the passive and alluring, albeit real, madness of women like Ophelia, Lady Macbeth, Juliet, Cleopatra, and even the girl's daughter in two uh, noble men, uh, two noble kinsmen. In fact, in, uh, when she's saying Ophelia is shown to be important only as the shadow of Hamlet, as observed by Jacques Lacan, or the quote-unquote other, who is defined vis-a-vis -vis the quote-unquote self that is Hamlet. 
in fact the only semi cellulo soliloquy that she is allowed after the nunnery scene is the comment on the changed nature of hamlet which becomes very ineffective because she is not only being watched by claudius and polonius but she is also reflecting on the feigned insanity of madness and so her uh, sympathy is actually totally misplaced here on the screen in fact you can see two versions of ophelia on the stage <clears throat> similarly the jailer's daughter in the two noble kinsmen is a quote unquote low character who is shown to be hopelessly devoted to the aristocratic palamon in when she is sane when she goes insane her madness is sought to be cured by several interchangeable men like palamon the wooer or the doctor who by turn become her lover as well as abuser <clears throat> certain things however begin to become clear upon a closer reading of the shakespearean text though elaine showalter calls ophelia's story the repressed story of hamlet shakespeare in fact contrasted ophelia's madness hello? with the faint hello hello am i audible hello 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 <coughs> yes ma'am hello yeah am i audible now hello hello am i audible yes yes go ahead okay thank you so much thank you i thought i wasn't uh, being heard okay um so uh, shakespeare as i was saying that um, uh, he showed a, a commented rather on the ambiguous hello? Um, innocence hello <clears throat> yes audible how oh, it is okay okay fine just let me know if you can't hear me yeah so uh, faced with similar circumstances now what shakespeare is very uh, uh, very cleverly trying to show when he shows uh, is uh, depicting the different reactions of ophelia and hamlet to uh, their father's uh, deaths uh faced with similar circumstances such as imperious and suspicious orders by the fathers a hostile court isolation and loss of a father under tragic circumstances how do they react now hamlet only pretends madness and he meditates upon revenge while ophelia she goes mad with unadulterated grief and executes her suicide so shakespeare in a way wanted to show that in fact ophelia had real feelings whereas hamlet was only pretending them <clears throat> now older interpretations saw shakespeare's mad women as um, namely ophelia and lady macbeth as disposable however modern feminist interpretation has regarded ophelia's madness as a liberation from the patriarchal control over her life exerted by her father her brother and king claudius her speeches and songs in a mad condition deliver a telling comment on domestic values marital infidelity man's faithlessness political upheaval and corruption in the court <clears throat> she remembers the symbolism of flowers however even as she is mad and she offers them around the court in her madness which symbolism is perfectly understood by the sane theater goers of the elizabethan times on the one hand the flower symbolizes the innocence of a bloom and <clears throat> on the other hand the flowers also symbolize the deflowering of ophelia she gives fennel which symbolized um, uh, marital infidelity and casting out evil spirits to claudius along with columbines which represent insincere flattery then she offers rue to gertrude now rue symbolizes repentance and sorrow 
but it is also known for its widely and highly abortive properties. So uh, thus it signifies loss of chastity on the part of both Ophelia and Gertrude. The daisies which he offers signify forsaken love. In fact, here on the right, you can see that Ophelia being portrayed in an opera where she's holding the various flowers which she's offering to different people in her madness. But the sense of the flowers is very much clear to the audience. <clears throat> the daisies which he offers signify forsaken love and innocence. Rosemary represents remembrance of dead at funerals. Now, obviously, Ophelia is here thinking of her dead father. Pansies represent togetherness and union. And then she gives both these flowers, the rosemary and pansies to her brother like this. She says then that the violets are withered. Now, obviously this, uh, the violets represent faithfulness and chastity again. So Ophelia by saying that the violets are withered is, is saying that Hamlet has taken her chastity. So she declares publicly, she makes it very apparent to the people in the court as well as to the people in the audience that she's lost her chastity uh, through Hamlet and she's not at all mad in conveying these things. Her song suggests both her courage and torment. In fact, on the Elizabethan stage, songs were sung only by mad women and courtesans. Ophelia's songs are laden with double meaning. A bonny sweet Robin is a lament for a dead lover while Robin is also used to signify the penis. She also sings the body ballad, uh, Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, which tells the story of a woman seduced by her social superior. Other feminist critics like Gabriel Dane believe that when patriarchal control is removed over Ophelia's life, <clears throat> Her identity is scattered in fragments and she loses her sense of self. And a, a motherless teenager, Claudius comments upon her condition in extremely telling terms. He, she, uh, he says, poor Ophelia divided from herself and her fair judgment without which we are pictures or mere beasts. Elaine Schewalter comments on the ambiguous way in which Shakespeare has portrayed Ophelia. She appears on stage dressed in white, uh, carrying wildflowers with hair hanging down, speaking extravagant metaphors and explosive sexual imagery. Thus her virginal white dress and eagerness to make amends is contrasted with the symbolic deflowering body ballads and ignorance of courtly niceties, suggesting ambiguously that she could not only be a mad woman, but also a jilted woman. <clears throat> now, you have to notice that modern psychoanalysis goes one step further. It analyzes Shakespeare's texts with a humanizing dimension and observes that Ophelia is not insane. She is, in fact, traumatized, what we describe as displaying PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, this satisfies the criteria laid down in DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. According to this analysis, Ophelia is not an irrational madwoman, but a human being like all of us who are cracking under excessive stress and trauma triggered by the immediate stressor of her father's death, lacking a maternal figure. Ophelia is brought up by Polonius, who is too absorbed in his courtly duties. He refuses to acknowledge the transformation even of his quote unquote green girl and insists that she quote unquote think herself a baby <clears throat> and commands her to reject her lover. She shares an affectionate relationship with her brother Laertes, as is visible in her repartee when Laertes is departing for France. Laertes cautions her against Hamlet's advances, to which Ophelia replies by asking him to behave well in France, a very brother-sister <clears throat> conversation going on. <clears throat> the mental and physical absences of father and brother <clears throat> and the insulting abandonment, abandonment by Hamlet lead her support structure to collapse. Uh, culminating in Ophelia's madness. She reaches out to a stranger for comfort. And who is this stranger? She looks in fact for maternal love in Gertrude. When she asks, 
where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? And she hopes for answers to her father's death. Uh, modern psychoanalysis also shows that children display disorganized and agitated behavior under trauma and Ophelia is hardly more than a child especially because of her innocence. And she is shown on stage as hemming and beating her heart and spurning enviously at straws. She resorts to songs she sings in her madness because she feels that her words will be inadequate and also because she is somehow aware of the guilty involvement of Claudius and Gertrude in the death of her father. This revelation comes to her in her so-called madness. This diagnosis of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder transforms Ophelia from a cravenly mad figure to in fact a lovable, approachable, innocent human being whose death could have been averted by sensible and timely intervention. It also establishes the right of women to be assisted and delivered from delirium. Coming to Lady Macbeth, Shakespeare gives her only prose lines in the sleepwalking scene as characteristic of persons suffering from mental agitation or somnambulism. Now, traditional criticism characterizes Lady Macbeth as a cross between a ruthless uh, histori hysterical woman and the witch who is ruthlessly ambitious and bereft of any maternal instincts. Robert Munro describes Lady Macbeth in her sleepwalking scene as a specter, a ghost, and as the evil counterpart of herself, which reveals the dark impulses of her subconscious mind. Freud diagnosed the sickness of Lady Macbeth as a direct relation to her childlessness, as in her waking moments, Lady Macbeth goes to great lengths to deny her maternal instincts and femininity. Um, Prashant, I'm audible. Hello. 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 Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, you, thank, you, thank, you, thank you so much. So, um, so this is modern psychoanalysis, however, goes one step further. And instead of criminalizing Lady Macbeth, it looks at her much more favorably and uh, diagnoses her trauma as arising from the uh, pangs of her conscience. Though Lady Macbeth is now the Queen of Scotland, she is very much aware of her mental estrangement from her husband. Now, reminiscences of her sins pass in a vivid panorama before her asleep yet awake eyes. Yet, who should have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? I tell you yet again, Banco's buried. He cannot come out of his grave. The Thain of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? All these lines are those that reveal her repressed guilt about the crimes she and her husband commit. Her insistence on washing her hand, the blood from her hands while sleepwalking, show a compulsive neurosis as blood is the dominating note in this tragic play. Thus Lady Macbeth's um, madness is not an irrational disease, rather it is pathological somnambulism, how we should understand it, uh, whereby the subject relives certain memories from the past in sleep, but upon awaking suffers from a sort of amnesia where she cannot re uh, remember um, the things that she did during the attack. Uh, we go over to Romeo and Juliet, and here you will see that the very different representation of Juliet. Uh, we will come to that later. But in Romeo and Juliet, again, there, are, uh, there is a representation of male as well as female madness. Uh, Romeo in Act 1, Scene 1 proclaims, what is love? A madness most discreet, a choking gall, and a withering, a preserving sweet. This sets early the tone of madness caused by love or erotomania. Now notice Shakespeare here depicts both Romeo and Juliet, the man and the woman suffering from love sickness or erotomania. And this leads to their respective suicides. In act four, scene four, 
Juliet sees Tybalt's ghost just as she is taking the sleeping potion. Romeo is a victim of passion, and his last passion-blinded act is to kill himself in thinking Juliet to be dead. Meanwhile, Juliet awaits to discover Romeo dead, and her suicide follows as a direct consequence of Romeo's suicide. The Elizabethan audiences would surely have remembered Hamlet's exhortation against sinful suicide. He said, God had, quote, fixed his cannon against self-slaughter, unquote. Shakespeare did not intend to preach. And Elizabethan ethos regarded suicide as a sin. But God was taught to show mercy to passionate sinners, that is, those who became temporarily mad from erotomania or love sickness. Barton's words serve as a contemporary comment upon this scene. From love, quote, comes repentance, dotage, they lose their cells, their wits, unquote. Similarly, Cleopatra decides to kill herself after her lover's suicide. A death which can be attributed to contemporary uh, madness, uh, to temporary madness caused by erotomania. Now, uh, there is this very famous scene where uh, Cleopatra commits suicide by holding the asp to her breast. She hopes to achieve reunion with Antony through death, but in her death, she's as passionate as and larger than life as when she was alive. And one of the reasons why Cleopatra chooses death is to refuse to allow the Romans to parade her through the streets as a lady boy apes her, quote, in the posture of a whore, unquote. Thus, though temporarily mad from grief, Shakespeare is sympathetic towards Cleopatra's character and shows, in fact, that she is still, even in her temporary madness, she, is, she has considerable political acumen in avoiding a humiliating death. In The Two Noble Kinsmen, the jailer's daughter becomes obsessive and mad in her love for the aristocratic Palamon. She starts following him in the forest, does not eat or sleep for two days, and has thoughts of um, killing herself. She's delusional, imagine herse imagining herself by the sea. The mad woman's ribald songs are easily identifiable by the Elizabethan audience for her madness and erotomania, and she sings frankly of her sexual desires in a saucy and humorous style. So very much of psychoanalytical interpretation is possible here, and it is not just madness which typifies this women. <clears throat> Shakespeare's text is, text is ambiguous about Ophelia's method of dying. You have to notice if madness or is suicide is madness, notice how Shakespeare makes Ophelia die. Queen Gertrude describes it as accidental drowning, whereas the gravediggers classify it as suicide. So by choosing the most preferred method of suicide by Elizabethan women, surely Shakespeare was making a social comment. So while Gertrude tries to cover up the death of Ophelia, saying that she drowned accidentally, in fact, Shakespeare wants to show that Ophelia was forced to commit suicide. <clears throat> Again, in other plays of Shakespeare, Rosalind refers to um, madmen in dark houses with whips. And when Romeo talks of men chained, starved, and tortured, he surely, Shakespeare is revealing <clears throat> negative criticism of the forced rehabilitation of mad people. How do these textual interpretations take place on stage? Generations of directors, actresses, and playwrights have been inspired to interpret Ophelia in a myriad ways. The critic Lee Edwards had said that we can imagine Hamlet's story without Ophelia, but Ophelia's story cannot be told without Hamlet. Despite having very little stage time, she has just five out of 20 scenes, Ophelia has become a rallying point for psychoanalysts and feminists successively. Ophelia, resplendent in virginal white on stage, was a symbol of pure and innocent virginity and represented a contrast to the intellectual fervor of Hamlet. Elaine Showalter points out that for the Elizabethans, just as Hamlet was a prototype of the melancholy and intellectually mad genius, 
Ophelia seizure was due to erotomania or love sickness. As such, she typically appeared on the stage in her mad scene in disheveled hair, offering flowers and herbs and alternatingly gesticulating, singing ribald songs and being apologetic. So her madness <clears throat> would have been immediately apparent to the Shakespearean audience. Augustan age then witnessed a backlash against Elizabethan theater, and this culminated in Jeremy Collier's famous protest in 1698, which also resulted in the closure of the theaters in 1642 and 1698. As a result of this, <clears throat> from then on, uh, any signs of corruption or immorality or in Ophelia were suppressed. And Mrs. Sarah Siddons, the famous actress, famously played Ophelia as the sweet but mad princess dignified to the last. The 19th century romantics, especially in France, however, were more open in their portrayal of Ophelia's sexuality. Harriet Smithson as Ophelia in 1827 entered in the mad scene uh, wearing a long black veil suggestive of Gothic mystery and feminine sexuality, along with wisps of straws in her hair. Uh, Victorian Ophelia, understandably, was a more subdued and admirable mad woman. However, actresses like Ellen Terry gave their own interpretation as Ophelia being a victim of sexual intimidation. Since the decades of 1970s, portrayed, uh, Ophelia is portrayed on stage more often as a violent madwoman, a schizophrenic patient who is given to in, uh, <clears throat> sudden and uncontrollable bouts of violence. In Marcelo Macchiaro's open air production of Hamlet in 1992, Two actresses were employed to show Ophelia's social persona and her doppelganger, the inner demon that revolts angrily. So in this particular production, Ophelia I is dressed <clears throat> virginally, while Ophelia II is dressed in a long diaphanous gown, which makes her sexuality very apparent. In the mad scenes, Ophelia II takes over completely finally ending in a dance of death in which the two cells of Ophelia finally unite. <clears throat> uh, some of the more modern performances have had more interesting takes where Ophelia is shown to be very much alive and kicking, not dead, and she is uh, portrayed as having alternative um, uh, existence as a suicide bomber or even as a terrorist, which is a very, very interesting take. Uh, Sarah Siddons, we have seen her picture earlier also here <clears throat> uh, in the Sleepwalking Lady Macbeth. The Sarah Siddons, the famous actress, starred in her brother John Kimball's production in 1794. And this was a very moving performance in which um, uh, the audience was moved to shrieks of fear and awe when Siddons did the uh, sleepwalking scene. And this even led William Hazlitt to comment that it was an unforgettable scene in one's lifetime. So her portrayal also co contributed to the conception of Shakespeare's um, uh, uh, plays as a character being the pivot of Shakespearean drama. How has the stage been converted onto the film or how have these representations been shown on film, the text? Uh, for example, in Ophelia, uh, in uh, the Lawrence Olivier film of 1948, uh, Ophelia has been given only about 800 words and uh, the Ophelia songs have been drastically cut down. Even the grave digger is allowed to sing, but Ophelia does not sing much. In Franco Zeffirelli's film of 1990, Helena Bonham Carter's, who plays Ophelia, her words are halved. Uh, so uh, she is not allowed much uh, dialogue. Uh, same thing is repeated in Michael Almereda's film of uh, 2000, where even Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are given more footage uh, than Ophelia. Uh, so her um, outbreak, her public breakdown, is not conveyed even through a song, but just through her screams. Uh, we find certain redemption in later films, however. 
so what we see in these filmmakers particularly is that uh, in in uh, in they show ophelia in three scenes in these films firstly hamlet in her chamber secondly in the nunnery scene and thirdly in the scene where she goes mad but it seems that by cutting down the dialogue of ophelia by not permitting her to sing uh, they are more and more drowning out her voice and is making the character they are making the character of ophelia uh, very much disposable <clears throat> However, there has been less bias depiction in other films where Ophelia's madness has not so much been ignored or her psychological manifestations have not so much been ignored. For example, in Kenneth Branagh's film of 20, um, uh, of, of, of later times and India's uh, very famous film, Haider by uh, Vishal Bhardwaj of 2016 and also the Bangla film, Hemonto by, directed by Anjan Dutt, uh, they show actually sex scenes between Hamlet and Othe Ophelia. So the whole idea of Ophelia's madness resulting from erotomania or love sickness is denied here. And rather her madness is said to emerge from her trauma at her father's loss and the political intrigue uh, which are um, upheaval taking place. Now in all these three films, Kenneth Branagh's film um, starring Kate Winslet or Haider, <clears throat> or um, Hemonto, in all these three films, Ophelia is shown to be considerably an intelligent character. Haider's portrayal, however, of Arshia leaves much uh, to be desired. Uh, there, Arshia is shown, uh, shown as an investigative journalist, in fact, so she is an independent self, but she does not, again, uh, take many, very many credible steps there to, uh, to assert herself. Uh, both the above-mentioned Indian films uh, omit Ophelia's mad singing. So the song is still done away with. The song has no expression in these films and Arshia's song in Haider can be uh, barely, barely heard. <clears throat> From the 17th century onwards, uh, writers like Marvel, Trehan and Dryden linked madness to literary inspiration. Swift applies madness to satirizings of political, philosophical and religious systems. However, Wordsworth, in a typically romantic manner, describes an idyllic state of madness. In his poem, The Mad Mother, he talks about the close bond between the mother and child. She is fiercely protective about her child and is happy even in her isolation as she has the baby and nature for company. The idea about the calming influence of motherhood on a mad woman is also shown in Wordsworth's another poem, The Thorn, but here he depicts the trauma of the mad woman losing her child. In The Thorn, Martha Ray's solitude suggests the cruel and unsympathetic nature of society, which does not comfort her in her madness. They wonder how the child had died, but nobody comes to comfort Martha Ray. So uh, the literature is commenting on the cruel and apathetic nature of society towards Wordsworth, uh, towards um, uh, the mad woman. Uh, the Victorians were ambivalent in their reaction to the mentally disturbed. On the one hand, they segregated the insane. On the other hand, they were terrified about the sane being illogically confined or wrongfully confined. Charlotte Bronte, as we will see in Jane Eyre, uh, in the portrayal of Mrs. Rochester, relied on the Gothic images of madness, but her portrayal of mental disturbance of Lucy Snow in her semi-autobiographical novel, Billet, is much more empathetic. And this could have resulted in her observation of uh, the very, um, uh, from very close quarters of her brother Branwell's descent into madness. In fact, it is interesting that uh, you can see the pictures of the three Bronte sisters here. Uh, and it is interesting that Emily Bronte was one of the first writers in English literature to use the term, quote unquote, mental illness um, instead of madness. <clears throat> In the 20th century literature, madness, though close to evil, also portrays essential spiritual truths. There is also harking back to the biblical notion of sin, the modern idea of how social isolation turns moral indignation into madness can be seen in Joris's White Sargasso Sea. 
with interesting parallels to Jane Eyre. Now, Antoinette uh, Causeway, the heroine of White Sargasso Sea, faces isolation in her childhood, further in the nunnery during her studies, culminating in her marriage to Rochester, who ignores her. In pursuit of escaping from her isolation, the sensitive Antoinette commits suicide. Jane Eyre is also isolated in her childhood, facing complex social bias in a fiercely patriarchal world. But unlike Antoinette, she is able to find her identity with the help of a powerful spirit and moral principles. Jane is simply isolated from society, but Antoinette is destroyed by society because she depends on the people who reject her. Uh, there is a curious subgenre of quote unquote mad women writing literature. There is the book of Marjorie Kemp, ghost written in the 1420s and considered by some to be the first autobiography in English language. Following the birth of her first child, Marjorie Kemp fell ill, suffered from bouts of madness, had several visions yet was tempted by sexual pleasures and social jealousy for several years. Eventually, she undertook a series of pilgrimages which are described in her book. Now, her book is significant is, as an autobiography and also as a pointer to female middle-class life in the Middle Ages um, and uh, rather than being the ramblings of a mad woman, it is an important spiritual and social commentary. It is also re uh, relevant recording the tension in late medieval England between institutional orthodoxy and increasingly public modes of religious dissent featuring the Lollards as well in the narrative. This kind of postpartum depression, that is depression coming after the birth of the first child usually, leading to madness has now become a much discussed phenomenon. So we have seen that these things have already been depicted in English literature long back, and it is only much later that now they are being recognized in society. Uh, this postpartum depression can be seen to be expressed in several autobiographical works like Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper or Emily Holmes Coleman's The, Shuttered, uh, the Shutter of Snow and also in uh, the poems of Anne Sexton. You can read this poem while I continue. Uh, of course, one is also aware of other quote unquote mad women writers like Mary Lamb, Louisa May Alcott, Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath, etc. To begin with, Mary Lamb was quite the devoted daughter, nursing her invalid parents while her brother Charles tried to earn meager wages as a clerk. Mary herself would stalk for long hours as the assistant of a dressmaker in order to supplement the scanty family income. However, unable to withstand the unaccumulated stress, uh, Mary suffered a bout of temporary madness and uh, knifed her mother fatally in September 1796, at the same time grievously injuring her father. But curiously, the death of both parents seemed to have set the literary ambitions of both Charles and Mary Lamb free. And uh, they went, they moved to London and uh, they set to hobnobbing with the smart set, the literary set, with Wordsworth, Coleridge, William Godwin, and they set down to writing extremely popular juvenile stories as well as uh, Shakespeare, um, uh, adapting Shakespeare for, the, for children. In fact, uh, much of the um, uh, overt masculinity in Shakespeare's plays is said to have been toned down and his plays are said to have been made more innocent and childlike by the genius of Mary Lamb. It was Mary who was uh, in fact, uh, attributed for much of the freshness, charm, and lucidity, which was seen even in Charles Lamb's uh, poems. Uh, you can see her on the right here in this slide. Um, but you know, increasing bouts of madness, however, put an end to her career, literary career. Uh, Louisa May Alcott, you can see her here on the top right. Uh, she also struggled to attain literary fame despite censure from her father. Madness was in the family genes and 
First, it um, uh, it made victims of her father, Bronson Alcott. Then her uncle, Junius, fell a victim to madness. And finally, Louisa herself succumbed to it. So in order to escape from these bouts of depression, Louisa would often turn to creativity. She did think of suicide, but decided instead to find solace in her work. Now, in Louisa's day, mental illness was considered a shame, and marrying for such families was considered taboo. So Louisa not only justifies this through her carols in uh, the volume work, A Story of Experience, but she herself never married, probably because she herself believed that mad people should not marry. Uh, uh, below right, you can see Virginia Woolf, where uh, now her literary expressions were only an effort to impose order on her sanity. Again, like Louisa, she tried to more and more overcome her depression by writing. Um, bipolarity ruled uh, Virginia's life and a projection of her childhood traumas and lesbian experiments merely sought to give a Freudian interpretation to her inner demons just before going down to the river to commit her suicide with stones in her pocket she wrote in a note i feel certain now that i'm going mad again i feel we can't go through this go through another of those terrible times and i shan't recover this time unquote the constant cycle of mania and depression had finally overtaken her, and the end came as her husband, Leonard Wolf, was himself struggling with his own bouts of depression. This tragic outcome is also seen in Sylvia Plath, who at the age of 31 took a bottle of sleeping pills and inhaled gas from the oven in an airtight kitchen. Infidelity of Ted Hughes led her to more and more depression and her poems graphically describe her depressed state. Her best poems came in the last few years of her life and they were only occasionally relieved by the extreme humor, uh, humor and wit that she could still manage to find in her life. How does this kind of madness uh, find an echo in another kind of stage, the modern stage, shall we say, shall we say or uh, the catwalk, which is also a kind of stage? So in fashion models, it had become a trend. Remember I had told you about how Smithson had portrayed um, Ophelia with a veil and straws in her hair. And that led to sort of a coiffure, which was called Ella Miss Smithson, a hairstyle in which uh, there was a black veil with wisps of straws stuck into it. Um, there is also the trend of the rebel woman in loose hair. Now, if you think of Ophelia, her loose hair, her madness, her, her disheveled state, it is also portrayed by many of the female singers today on the modern stage, in their songs, in their performances, where they're talking of uh, depression, of drug abuse, of their inner demons again and again and again. In fact, <clears throat> one of uh, the very songs which comes to mind is Madonna's uh, Papa Don't Preach. And I would say that if you if you have heard this song or if you read the lyrics, uh, you would feel perhaps that a modern Ophelia would have spoken like this. Maybe she would have been more assertive. Maybe she would have told her father, Papa, don't preach um, because I want to keep my baby and I want to face life as it is. So Papa, don't preach. I'm going to keep my baby. Um, these are, um, uh, there are several such instances of these, this letting down the hair, but sometimes it is all that a performer or a woman performer can do to show her angst, how to shake her head, how to let loose her hair, literally. Um, I come, I end this talk with uh, these beautiful lyrics by Lady Gaga, beautiful and rebellious uh, lyrics by Lady Gaga, where she says, I have had enough, this is my prayer, that I'll die living just as free as my hair. So the hair here symbolizes the freedom that she wants to obtain from the patriarchal society. I've had enough, I'm not a freak. 
my depression, my mood swings, my bipolar disorder does not make me a freak, rather treat me as a person facing trauma, facing stress. So I've had enough, I'm not a freak. I just keep fighting to stay cool on these streets. Yes, this is literature too. This is song. This is literature. This is poetry. I've had enough, enough, enough. And this is my prayer, I swear. I am as free as my hair. I'm as free as my hair. I am my hair. I am my hair. Thank you. Uh, Prashant. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, please. There are certain questions in Q and A. Uh, yes, I will just stop sharing. And yes, should I go to okay. the chat box? Yes, yes, yes. Not uh, chat box, Q and A box. A Q and A box. Yeah, I, I can uh, see some questions. Uh, yes. How to get attendance certificate for this session would, of course, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> would be answered by you. Uh, thank you so much for listening so patiently. Um, uh, I have this question by Pranav Koche, right? The first uh, yes. Pranav, hi. Uh, so nice of you to attend. Uh, Women's sexuality or its expression has been largely associated with so-called madness. What may be the reason? Well, um, again, I mean, what you cannot accept, you deny, right? So if you cannot accept women's sexuality, you call the woman mad or a witch. So these are the various ways that patriarchal society uh, always uh, attends to these problems of acceptance of women's freedom or rather the lack of acceptance. Um, I hope um, that answers your question. Uh, Gopika ji, uh, very warm good afternoon. Uh, Ma'am, is madness, uh, uh, I cannot understand this word, by it's losing okay, okay. Uh, by losing grip on reality or losing sanity, uh, explain with reference to Gilman's yellow wallpaper story. Uh, well, I haven't uh, read the yellow wallpaper story in, in some time, but uh, uh, what is, um, uh, is, uh, is madness a curse? Okay, okay by losing grip on reality or losing sanity. So is I would say it is a constant interaction, uh, rather, if you read even Gilman's story, uh, what I remember of it is that it is a constant interaction between societal factors as well as uh, the mental uh, world, the inner world that exists between us. So there are things which uh, interplay, things which happen and interact with each other, uh, which sort of bring out the outer stress and sort of um, uh, happen to trigger off inner stresses as well. So uh, I think it is a combination of uh, both uh, the real and the mental world interacting and colliding and producing sparks. Uh, thank you so much. There is another question by Gopika ji. Uh, what is your opinion about love is madness rather madness is genius? Um, it's it's uh, rather ambiguously worded. Um, love is madness, rather madness is genius. So uh, yes, I mean, uh, we have uh, known about several people who are who have been driven a mad by love, as I have been quoting in my speech, how, how various kinds of erotomania have been expressed or found expression often in literature. At the same time, madness is also genius. So when there is, uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the, the outer world, uh, does not permit expression of 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 uh, genius or uh, expression of a uh, certain um, uh, extra uh, capabilities. So then it is that the madness comes forth, and the person tries to justify his extraordinary acts by uh, behaving in a mad manner. So um, in both the cases, uh, these two kinds of uh, madnesses are seen. But uh, rather, this is a love is madness is more of a temporary phenomenon. I would say, as contrasted to the other form, which is more, uh, more permanent, because a genius always, as we know, performs in extraordinary ways. Uh, Dipanita. Um, well, we are going uh, <laughs> very, very, um, uh, yes, there are questions being asked from several texts here. So what is your opinion about Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights? Do you think he lost his sanity due to love sickness? How is it different from Catherine in the novel? Uh, 
again, a passion here seems to play a very much uh, uh, prominent role. Um, it is uh, Heathcliff's desire uh, not just to um, embrace a certain person, but also, I think, to overcome uh, certain social constrictions that he has been uh, facing. And uh, Catherine, on the other turn, um, on, on the other hand, is a much more, um, uh, what shall we say, um, a much more assertive personality who has certain um, uh, intellectual uh, uh, means of holding on to the person she loves. But uh, yes, uh, there is um, an insanity in both in the severe obsession that they encourage and um, harbor about each other. Uh, hi, Pranav. Um, I can see some of you, yes. Ruchi. Um, yeah. yes. Namaskar, Ruchi ji, namaskar. Um, and uh, I think what you may have was one question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Should I go ahead? Uh, no, no. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 Are they? Oh, I think she's not. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. So uh, when it comes, to women, it is a given that uh, you know women going paranoid is like a regular thing because they're not able to. Oops. They're not able to express themselves. Uh, so even we see this in literature. So I just wanted to know your opinion about it. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, that is what we have been talking all along, right? I mean, how do, how do they express? They, they are not allowed to normal avenues of expression. So obviously it, it finds channels where it is considered as abnormal. So yes, I mean, that is what we have been talking about. Thank you so much. Um, Prashant, shall we go on to the yes. next? Okay. Yes, next question. Yeah, uh, Nidhi ji, uh, ma'am, do you think that women compare the suppression with ecological de destruction, which is also made by patriarchal mindset? This is a very, um, uh, a very popular uh, a fact that is being uh, a popular uh, comparison that is being made these days, and um, it is. Um, uh, rather, I would say that this kind of um, ecological uh, parity being drawn uh, with uh, women is is rather putting a burden on women because it, it seems as if only women are uh, uh, are being equated not only with nature but it also seems that many women are uh, are women are being charged with uh, taking care of the nature and environment and it is not uh, that I feel I feel that it is a collective burden that one has to share so it is not just the patriarchal mindset but I think that um, uh, women do not uh, uh, consciously do it they do not consciously acquire this kind of mindset rather it is being uh, put on and again I would say that that is also a very patriarchal reading of the ecological destruction which is going on in the world. Uh, thank you Dr. Nayar Jahan. The portrayal yes, of... There, there is a doctor. Yes. Uh, he wants to ask one question to you. Yes. Yes. Please. Are you there sir? I am. Yes sir. Dr. Nayar sir. Hello. Hello. Okay, you can read uh, his question. Yes, if he's on, if he's on, um, uh, we can surely go on to his question. Uh, Dr. Nayar Jahan has asked the portrayal of insanity in Shakespeare, which is more situational rather than biological. Can we consider in this regard Shakespeare as great psychologist in his own way. Um, yes, I mean, you have in your question just seconded what uh, I have been saying through my talk, uh, that uh, Shakespeare did try to uh, make possible, um, uh, to bring to the fore hidden uh, psychological concerns. And of, obviously he has been uh, described as a master studier of characters. So uh, in a way he was also trying to usher in certain new psychological thinking and um, uh, through his great psychological studies. Um, thank you. Uh, Ashok Kadamji, uh, Namaskar. Ma'am, colonialism and patriarchy are two structures as both are repressive, exploitative, hegemonic. How do you access the relationship between colonialism and patriarchy, especially in Indian context? Um, 
there is um, it is it is uh, they are as you said two power structures but uh, while colonialism and patriarchy are definitely having featuring the same features it is not that patriarchy is has died out with colonialism or has been especially fostered by colonialism in fact even in the post colonial indian context we see that new forms of colonialism are arising even as we progress as a society more and more uh, there are uh, more and new are ways of harassing women of going after women of portraying them in a very negative light so both these um, while they are contributing to each other i would feel that patriarchy continues down the ages and is not limited by certain phases in the indian life um thank you so much uh, dimple ji do you feel the web series for more shots please addresses women sexuality in our society but in elite society and uh, where a character called damini has ocd yes she has obsessive compulsive disorder um <clears throat> dimple ji while i don't watch web series in fact i don't watch tv much uh, because of lack of time but uh, yes i have read reviews of the series and what i know about the series is that <clears throat> it is um, it is kind of a um, uh take on a take off on uh, sex in the city which was a very popular hbo shows show mm -hmm. once upon a time so it, it is like uh, uh, i would feel that the uh, world that they portray or the or the problems that they portray are very limited in their ambit and it is only as you have already commented that it is very elitist and very um uh, con con confined to a certain uh, definite uh, elitist circle or urban circle uh, so they it is showing their problems but i think we have uh, much much more layers of problems uh, happening amongst women who are uh, definitely out of this circle so <clears throat> um though uh, uh, again some people have liked this show very much i am not a, a very great admirer um thank you so much and uh, uh, harry sir has said <clears throat> uh edna pontelius suicide in kate shopa's novel the awakening how do you see it in terms of madness or erotomania um, i wouldn't be comment able to comment on this right now because i would have to uh, go through this again so prashant is it okay if i get back to him later yes, yes. with my yes, comment yes. Okay. okay thank you so okay. much okay. harry for your uh, comment uh, ruchi ji has said madness in women is a given in our patriarchal society and is even looked upon as a nuisance as compared to man's madness it is even evident through literature what is your opinion yes because uh, again a woman is a very disposable uh, factor i mean uh, she can be dumped in a in a in a home she can be dumped off uh, she can be dumped off on the road side and you would just get rid of her why should you um, carry on supporting a mad woman in your house so um it is that um, men are treated men are um, as as uh, potential bread earners of the family men are supposed to um, you know um, are are uh, more uh, they are more uh, provided with more facilities to uh, be cured whereas a woman is just uh, abandoned and um, she is um, and doesn't have that kind she doesn't share the same kind of fate and is also subject to other kinds of abuse not just abandonment but also physical and violent abuse uh, vijay ji uh, namaskar uh, will the feminist critics accept lady macbeth as a mad lady ruining <laughs> macbeth and his kingdom i don't think uh, that is likely to come because um, uh, that is exactly what i have been saying in my talk to have a more um, psychoanalytical interpretation of lady macbeth and not just dismiss her as a very ambitious um, lady who is uh, thoroughly responsible for macbeth's downfall because if lady macbeth had ambition so had macbeth so both of them um, you cannot uh, say that the man is totally led by the woman and he could have easily refused to do the things that he did uh thank you so much uh please tell madness in indian context so uh i don't know what this um, comment means perhaps prashant you would uh, ask him to uh, okay. clarify his comment later on yeah, shampa yeah, yeah. ji shampa ji um uh, 
very good afternoon. Is madness and eccentricity in women an offshoot of subversion or years of subjugation? Uh, subversion, I would say, is the way women try to get back at society or at the patriarchal order. It is there are there is definitely years of subjugation through which madness and eccentricity are able to come out. Uh, subversion would be rather in the ways in which this madness or eccentricity in women, they try to face it and try to get back in society in their own way. It could be as Ophelia comes out uh, of her offers subjugation and through her madness she speaks out certain truths she lets the whole world know about her relationship with hamlet or about certain promises which had been made to her and that um, how claudius and um, gertrude are leading an immoral relationship so there is um, a subversion i would say is rather an a, a way of getting back out of the subjugation uh, even in a so called eccentric or men state of mental illness um Prashant, these are uh, all Prashant. the questions that I have received. Uh, there is one question that I would uh, like to get back to. I think Harry's question, which I would be sure if you could send it to me later, or maybe, yeah, yeah I could uh, also see it here. Any more questions, Prashant? Yeah. Uh, are you there, Dipanita, ma'am? Yes, I can see her name here, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, Dipanita. Yes, Do you have any? Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Do you have any question? No, I just asked her about the novel Wuthering Heights. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and and uh, I, that's what probably I also thought about it. Mm -hmm. Thank so you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you yes. so much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yes, Nayar Jahan, yes. Hello, sir. Dr. Nayar, sir. Yes, he's there. I can see his box. Yes, but uh, he is not audible. I'm, I'm anyway, amazed. I'm move. amazed. Yeah, <laughs> with the, so much uh, response. Anyway, we can move towards Pranav, sir. Yes, Pranav, sir. Pranav, sir, wants to make certain comments. Yes, yes go ahead, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. okay uh, ahead, we can have an alternative title for this particular session that is Mad Women in Literary Attic. It was a fantastic modern psychoanalysis <laughs> of women characters. Mandakini, ma'am. Thank you so much, Prash. Pranav. I'm so happy to meet you again, to see yes, you again. Same year, same year, ma'am. Absolutely. Uh, actually, we are remi reminded here of Foucault. Mm -hmm. who says that uh, what is criminal or psychological abnormal, psychologically abnormal or sexual deviant is yes. defined by the dominant discourse at a particular time. So we are very much uh, remind, uh, reminded of that particular quote. Mm, absolutely. And, and generally this, uh, you know, mad, mad uh, people or psychological patients, psychologically ill patients, they are discriminated with, they are oppressed. And when it comes to women, they are doubly marginalized. Okay. That is what uh, my take is. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, ma'am. Actually, you had a, you have presented such a vast uh, survey of this topic, this madness. <laughs> yeah, right from Greek. You, I, I suppose, you started from Greek literature and you came to Lady Gaga. Yeah. <laughs> now, such an extent, <laughs> such an extent, an enjoyable survey that was. And, uh, Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoyed this. I really Thank enjoyed. Thank you so it. much. And uh, one particular aspect, I even uh, many of us did not know that marriage was considered a cure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, just as lesbian marriage is also considered a cure for lesbianism similarly oh. because lesbianism ah. is also considered a kind of sickness. sickness. So you mm -hmm. cure women of lesbianism by getting them married. So similarly so many men and women are just married off. <laughs> it seems so, yes. <laughs> okay, so, ma'am. Uh, thank yeah, you so I, much. I'll, I'll come to the uh, thanks, vote of thanks. On behalf of yeah, yeah. all the participants, sir, shall I, shall I continue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. On behalf of go all ahead. the participants in this webinar and on YouTube, I heartily thank Professor Mandakini Bhattacharya for her lively as well as intellectual inputs, which is so rare, you know. 
I, either talk is intellectual or it is lively but you have combined both of them <laughs> thank you for uh, listening so patiently no 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 it was it was a, a feast rather i also must take this opportunity to thank or rather express my gratitude to dr prashant mothe absolutely yeah who has availed this wonderful intellectual feast for us i thank all the participants who always listen and comment on youtube as well as in webinars Absolutely. So I thank all of you from bottom of my heart. I again thank Manda Kini Ma'am and Prashant Sir for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Prano Sir. Thank you very much, Manda Kini Bhattacharya yeah. Ma'am, for your fruitful, highly informative, in enlightening, interactive, thought-provoking, and insightful session. Thank, thank you very you. much, one and all, for thank your active participation. by logging zoom and those who are watching and learning on youtube channel and made this lecture series a grand success langley uh, lecture series believe in the philosophy let's learn from each other so uh, stay stay at home stay safe thank you very much thank, thank, you. thank, thank you thank you namaskar thank you thank you thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you